Question, how many times did he say Flink when he introduced me? <laughs> I'm just kidding, okay. Cool, uh, thanks everyone. Uh, I'm Beckett and uh, I'm, oh, where's my slides? Oh, here it is. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm, okay, okay. Uh, the cover slide is missing, but anyway. So I'm Beckett and today I would like to share with you our experience about our vision and practice of stream and batch unification at LinkedIn. So uh, as you might have already heard the word stream and batch unification uh, in the previous keynote uh, like talks quite a few times, right? So what is stream and batch unification? Let's take a look at that first. So assuming you have a bunch of data in the middle, right? And what you want to do is that you want to build some data applications around the data. And you know that your data application has some business requirements like data freshness, throughput, and cost that you have to you know, meet. And also you want a data application to have good scalability, stability, and operability, maybe extensibility as well, right? So with all those requirements, how are you going to do it? The answer is that you need data infrastructure. So what's included in data infrastructure? First of all, you must have computing engines, right? It helps you to express your processing logic. And as you can see, all, are, uh, all the logos here are the projects that we are using at LinkedIn for a computing engine purpose. And you also need data storage, which helps you to store and access your data. And you also need some control plane, which helps you to do the orchestration work. As you can see, you might need you know, resource management, you might need to deploy your job, you might need to workflow, uh, manage your workflows, so on and so forth. Also, you need data modeling, which helps you to define your data format, to define your schema, to manage your metadata of the data, and also you know, do something like uh, data lineage, right? things like that. Last but not least, you also need some supporting toolings, which includes you know, metrics, logging, alerting, testing, releasing, security, stuff like that. So all those five categories you know, uh, com uh, composes the data infra that we can rely on to develop our data applications. And then we tell our uh, application developer saying that now what you can do is that you can define and you can design your data application with batch processing, stream processing, maybe also ad hoc queries. Um, and interestingly, if you look at all those projects in the data infrastructure realm, you might find that each project is particularly good at doing either stream processing or batch processing, but usually not both. For example, at LinkedIn, we use Samza and Flink for stream processing, and we use Spark for batch processing and Trino for ad hoc queries. And in the storage category, we have Kafka for streaming and HDFS for batch, right? And in the control plane, we have Yarn mostly for uh, offline, uh, that's batch processing, and we have Kubernetes mostly for stream processing. And we also have uh, Airflow and Azkaban, that is for workflow management. And there's no counterparts in the stream processing world yet. And for the data modeling, usually we use Avro and Protobuf, those like role-based format for stream processing. And we have Parquet and ORC, which are columnar for batch processing. And you can see similar things in the supporting toolings as well. So basically, if you look at it, it's an interesting thing that we have like two completely different worlds for stream processing and batch processing. And each one creates, creates basically their own you know, closed loop to deliver the, the functionalities. And then once in a while you might hear, okay, my application doesn't you know, only rely on one of the batch processing or stream processing, I need both. So how can you do it? And then we invented something like Lambda architecture or Kappa architecture and we tell our developers, okay, if you need both, then try those out. This actually works fine and brings us until today. And then comes the question, can it be simpler? The answer is of course yes. So the first thing coming to our mind is basically, can we unify the stream and batch processing API first? So at LinkedIn, we used Apache Beam as a unified API for batch and stream processing. And we also launched this project Coda, that's compute and data convergence in order to you know, provide a unified uh, data access layer as well as the data processing layer for our uh, application developers. 
And the whole purpose here is just to provide this unified authoring experience to our developer so they don't need to deal with all the heterogeneous systems under the hood. And then there comes a question, what about the operation and debugging you know, experiences? And the answer to that is that we need a technical stack unification. So the idea is that in addition to the unification of the API, we also want to have just one technical stack that can deal with both streaming and batch at the same time. And for the computing engine, as an example, we're taking Apache Flink as our unified engine for stream and batch uh, processing at the same time. And with that, we have Apache Beam as our programming API with Flink Runner under the hood. And we also have Apache Flink SQL as our SQL API across the board. And that's both for the stream processing and batch processing at the same time. And with that, we call it like full stream and batch unification experience. And as you can see, this is the effort across the entire data infrastructure. Although I only put you know, Flink um, in, the, in the computing engine as a technical stack unification part here, but you might see other projects in different categories in data infrastructure that is trying to do the same. For example, Apache Paimon, you have heard this project multiple times in the previous keynote. And this is basically an effort to unify the storage for stream and batch, right? And there are control plane and data modeling part as well, which is trying to do the similar things. And with that, we tell our user, okay, now you have a completely new design paradigm. It's sort of new, but it's, if you think about it, it's, it's not really new because it's the most natural way for you to develop your application, which means that you don't need to distinguish between streaming and batch at all. Right. This should be how you deploy or develop, design your application uh, to start with. So that sounds very familiar, right? We have heard the idea about, okay, you only need one engine to deal with everything. And that sounds like from the Kappa architecture. So how is that different from Kappa architecture? So what Kappa architecture tells you is that logs and stream processing is all you need. So for example, if you're trying to do a backfill, Essentially, that becomes, you know, replay the entire historical logs and do stream processing. And you don't need batch processing at all. And what we are trying to do with stream and batch unification here is that we want to have, you know, one unified storage which achieve this, the, the following goal. You have one, one data set, but you can actually access the data set in multiple different ways. So you can actually read it as logs. You can also do a range scan on top of it. And you can also do a KV lookup on the on data set. In, and in terms of the query, the only thing you need to care about is to express your query logic with your SLA. And you don't need to worry about whether it's going to be run as a stream processing or batch processing or ad hoc queries. That is going to be hidden from the, our end user and decided by the system itself, depending on your SLA. And um, if we take a look at that, then the backfill works in the following way. We might have a batch job consuming from HDFS in the batch uh, processing manner until it catches up with the current timestamp, then it switches over to read from Kafka and use stream processing to continue uh, you know, with the stream processing. And all those transition, transitions and switchovers are going to be automatic and you don't need to worry about how to do it. And one question there might be, okay, can I just use the stream processing engine to do the batch processing? After all, we have heard this, right? So batch is a special case of streaming. Well, conceptually, yes. But if you take a look at what we're dealing with uh, in the stream processing, we're actually having you know, this infinite out of order dynamic data sets all the time. And the key challenge here is that how do we guarantee the stream processing semantics? In order to fulfill the semantics, we invented many things like watermarks, retractions, checkpointing, you know, state in order to fulfill the stream, uh, stream processing semantics. And if you look at the batch world, what we are dealing with is like finite, organized static data sets. And the key challenge there is actually how can we proactively plan for the execution time and resources based on the char characteristics of those data sets you know, to maximize our hardware utilization and to run the query as fast as possible. To achieve that, we actually have to rely on those execution stages, speculative execution, adaptive execution, all the data skipping technologies there. 
So, and the challenge for a stream and batch unification engine is that you have to design this engine to support both worlds with the query optimization, scheduling, shuffle, state backends, connectors, everything taken in, into consideration. And it's not an easy work. And I'm super proud of the Flink community who have spent, you know, remarkable and relentless effort in the past few years to achieve this. At this point, I think Flink is the only streaming engine that can support all the TPCH queries for stream processing. And that's for, you know, the entire stream processing semantics fulfilled. And in terms of the batch processing performance, we see dramatic improvements in the past few open source releases that helps us to, you know, grow the um, batch processing performance significantly in TPCTS. So kudos to the community. And why should we care about it? When we talk about stream and batch processing, why should we care about it? What's it's going, why it's so important? To answer that question, let's take a look at the infrastructure cost model. So usually there are five different categories of costs when you are looking at an infrastructure project. First of all, it's migration cost. So basically, if you're not adopting this technology yet and you'll try to use it, you have to migrate to it and that's going to be a cost. And after that, you might need to learn the new technology and you might have new hires that need to be familiar with your tech stack and that's the learning cost. And in order to you know, keep the things running fine without broken, you have to have the maintenance cost there and uh, you have to apparently spend a lot of time to develop your features to support your business requirements. So that's the development cost. And finally, you will have to put a bunch of hardware there to run your system. So that's the execution cost. So four out of those five costs are actually long-term costs. And those costs will accumulate over the time. And if we, took, if we take a look at those five categories, development cost, maintenance cost, and learning cost, three, th those three costs together, we call it engin uh, engineering productivity. So that basically means as a developer, it's very likely at any given time, you're going to be on one of those three things. And unfortunately, in the past few years, as we see the complexity of the application and data infrastructure goes up over years, we see the cost uh, in development, maintenance, and learning also goes up. That basically means our productivity is decreasing as the complexi uh, complexity of the system uh, grows up. So, and the whole purpose of stream and batch unification is to reduce you know, the development cost, maintenance cost, and learning cost. Therefore, you have a better productivity. And admittedly, admittedly you know, you might see a, you know, a, a, a sort of a increase in execution cost, mainly due to the reason that at this point, a, unifi a unified engine might not be as performant as a specialized, you know, engine in a heterogeneous architecture. However, that's not going to be all the, uh, you know, be, be like that all the time. Uh, it's going to be improved, but it's just right now we're still having this issue. But even with that, let's take a look at a toy example and see what we can gain from stream and batch unification. So on the left hand side, this is the uh, cost estimations for um, before and after we adopt the stream and batch unification. Assuming we have like 100 units of the costs in total and 10% in learning, 15% in maintenance, 25% in development, and half of the total per, uh, cost are in execution. And this is uh, the cost before we migrate to stream and batch unification. And after we migrate to stream and batch unification, we may spend you know, uh, 30 units of the costs in migration. Uh, and that's basically 30% of the original uh, annual spending. And uh, after the migration, we expect our learning cost to drop by 70% from 10 to three. And we expect our maintenance and development cost to cut in half. And we give some headroom for our execution cost growth. We expect it's going to be increased by 25%. I would say it's, this is a pretty generous headroom there already. And with that number or assumption, we can see the total cost after the migration would be 85.5 units. And that's going to be a 14.5 percentage drop from the, before the migration. And on the right-hand side, it shows you the you know, uh, return of investment, essentially. And it shows you if you start to adopt this migration at year zero, 
And then, you know, you're going to, what you're, what you're going to say, uh, see is that you might spend a little bit more for the migration years, and afterwards, the cost actually drops. And in year three, as you can see, the, the blue line is actually going to uh, be under the red line. So the blue line here actually is a cumulative cost uh, with the, the migration, and the red line is the cumulative cost without the migration. So after year three, you will see your total cost is going to benefit your business. And remember, this is not, not only about the cost. This also means that you can react to your business requirement to the market in a more agile way. So there is some more chance for you to seize the business opportunity, and you can deliver your features to your customers in a much sooner way. And um, so with that, uh, let's take a look at our journey. So um, there's a project called Apache Samza developed at LinkedIn, uh, and it's originally created at LinkedIn for stream processing. In 2015, uh, we started to use Apache Samza for batch processing as an, a part of our effort to, see, uh, uh, to seek for the you know, unification for stream batch unification. And in 2016, we used Apache Beam uh, as a streaming API at LinkedIn. And in 2019, we introduced Apache Flink as a streaming engine. And in 2020, we launched this project called Stretch. That's essentially stream and a batch. You put it together and get a word stretch. And uh, uh, we use Apache Beam as a stream and batch unification API at that point. And we use Beam plus Backgrounder for batch processing. And we, at, at the exact same year, we started to explore Flink Batch our, as our batch solution. And in 2020, we launched Project Coda. That is uh, compute and data uh, convergence. So we have the uh, we're looking for the convergence of data access, and we started to you know use Flink as our convergence computing engine uh, for the, uh, the stream and batch unification. Okay, today if we take a look at the you know the, the technology adoption cycle or the life cycle curve, uh, that's what Alex mentioned earlier. Where is stream and batch unification in this curve? So I would say, thanks to Flink, um, we are actually at the very end of the early adopter stage for the computing engine in terms of stream and batch unification. So we are about to see you know, the early majority and fast growth of the adoption in the community about this you know, unified engine. And for the rest of the you know, data infrastructure categories like storage, control plane, I would define it as still in the very earlier stage. It's like in the innovation stage. And overall, for stream and batch unification, I think we are roughly about here. Okay. So uh, as a recap of my uh, today's presentation, we talked about the you know, systematic efforts across the data infrastructure uh, for the stream and batch unification. Remember, this is not only about its, uh, engine or storage. It's about all the five categories of the, all the data infrastructure in order to deliver uh, you know, a production-ready system that you can claim stream and, production, uh, stream and batch unification. Um, and also, we talked about the new data application design paradigm, which is the world that you don't need to worry about stream or batch unification uh, uh, processing at all. And uh, um, we also talk about the technology challenges and readiness of stream and batch unification, and also the cost model and our business justifications. And finally, we also went through our journey at LinkedIn uh, for the stream and batch unification. And uh, that actually concludes uh, my uh, today's uh, presentation. So thanks again, everyone, for coming. Yeah.